Hi, everybody. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and a member of this group. This is the Big Book Workshop. We're starting on page six tonight in the chapter called Bill's Story. And it's the first chapter in the book. And it's a story of Bill's progress through his drinking career. Started with a drink at a party when he's going to war. Nothing big, no big deal about it. He went, he drank some overseas. He came back. He drank some more when he came back. And he got involved in the stock market. He went through the stock market and did all kinds of crazy things and drank the whole time. But he was drinking every day. And he was getting drunk every day. And then, you know, when anything happened, he went back to alcohol big. Like when a lot of the things that were happening in his life could be maybe considered um, life on life's terms. What was the problem is how he reacted to those things that were life on life's terms. We went back to the point where the stock market crashed and all his friends lost all their money. And so did he. He was broke. They got devastated by the stock market crash. Men were jumping out of the windows on Wall Street. And he said, would I jump? No, I went back to the bar. That was how he reacted just to a really horrible historic day in the economy of the United States. He just went to the bar and he drank and drank. He didn't, he didn't stop. Uh, and he continued. He continued to the point where on page five at the top, he says, Liquor ceased to be a luxury. It became a necessity. Uh, bathtub gin, two bottles a day, often three, got to be the routine. So his drinking got to be to a point where it wasn't just drinking. It was drinking because he had to drink, not because he wanted to drink. It became a necessity. And when that happened, that was the time that he crossed the line. When he got to the point where he was drinking out of necessity, that means he had to have a drink. As far as he was concerned, he had to have the booze. So it became a big part of his life, and he crossed the line there. And he went on, he kept on drinking and drinking, and he kept on saying, this had to be stopped. I saw I could not so much as take one drink. I was through forever. But he picked up another drink. So he knew he was powerless. He was beginning the process early on to start thinking about the powerlessness of alcohol. And he was recognizing it. But he didn't know anything about alcoholism. He didn't understand he had an allergy. The doctor, he hadn't met the doctor, uh, Dr. Silkworth yet. So he didn't know he had an allergy. So he kept drinking and he could not, not stop. Even when he wanted to quit, he could not quit. It finally got to a place where he really knew powerlessness. In the last paragraph we read last week, the first full paragraph on page six, the remorse, horror, and hopelessness of the next morning was unforgettable. The courage to do battle was not there. My brain raced uncontrollably, and there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. I hardly dared to cross the street lest I collapse and be run down by an early morning truck, for it was scarcely daylight. An all-night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were stilled at last. A morning paper told me the stock market had gone to hell again. Well, so had I. The market would recover, but I wouldn't. That was a hard thought. Should I kill myself? So he's thinking about suicide at this point. Before, when all the men jumped out the windows on the first crash, he said, oh, no, I'm not going to kill myself. But now he's thinking about it. You know, the, the thought crossed his mind. Would I, you know, should I kill myself? No, not now. Then a middle fog settled down. Gin would fix that. So two bottles and oblivion. And that's where he reached the point where he was drinking for the worst reason of all. To completely eradicate any thoughts or actions or life that he had and just go into pure oblivion. To where nothing mattered. No, no body mattered. No thing mattered. No nothing mattered. He was in complete oblivion. So he was really getting bad. So you would think, 
when he's talking like that, that he's that bad. He knows he's powerless. He knows he's got to quit. He's been trying to quit over and over, not making it so. He'd been in the hospital already one time, but he, you know, he just couldn't, he couldn't handle it. He couldn't get stopped. So we'll continue tonight and find out what actually finally got him to the place he needed to be. So we're starting on page six, the last full paragraph on the page. It says, the mind and body are marvelous mechanisms, for mine endured this agony two more years. Sometimes I stole from my wife's slender purse when the morning terror and madness were on me. Again, I swayed dizzily before an open window or the medicine cabinet where there was poison cursing myself for a weakling. There were flights from city to country and back as my wife and I sought escape. So all his drinking had not been for escape. Now he's trying to escape what made him drink. But when he, everywhere he went, he took himself with him, so the problem stayed with him. He said, then came the night when the, the physical and mental torture was so hellish I feared I would burst through my window, sash and all. Somehow I managed to drag my mattress to the lower floor, lest I suddenly leap. So he was to the point, he was so afraid of his mental condition and his physical condition, because he was incredibly drunk, that he wouldn't even sleep upstairs. I mean, he dragged his mattress down to the first floor, so if he was so crazed that he jumped out a window, he wouldn't get hurt. That's a bad alcoholic. That's a guy that knows he's in bad shape. It's a problem. So, what did he do? Did he fix it then? Did he realize he was drunk? Well, he got a doctor, and a doctor came with a heavy sedative. The next day found me drinking both gin and sedative. So, he didn't even slow down at this point. When he was so afraid, he couldn't, he had to drag his mattress to the first floor. You'd think the guy might want to try to stay sober. But instead, he took the sedative and gin, which is deadly. This combination soon landed me on the rocks. People feared for my sanity. So did I. I could eat little or nothing when drinking. And I was 40 pounds underweight. And this is a problem. Bill was drinking himself to death because he was suffering now from malnutrition. Which... When you have no nutrition in your body, your whole body, all your organs, everything, including your mind, your brain, is lacking nourishment. So you can't think clearly. You can't do anything. I mean, this is alcohol killing you through a different thing. Malnutrition. I one time ended up, I didn't know. I was drinking all the time. I was drunk all the time. And I ended up in a hospital. Because I cut three fingers off because I was drunk. Uh, I cut three fingers off and I had to get them sewed back on. So I was in a hospital. And they kept me, which is kind of unusual. But they kept me for three or four days. And the doctor had ordered food for me and told me to order food from any restaurant I wanted. They'd get it and they'd bring it to the room. And I said, why are you doing this? He says, because you're mal malnourished. You need to eat. Your hand will not heal. Your body will not heal unless you eat food. So I'm going to keep you in the hospital until you've gotten some nutrition in you. And he bought me food. And I was so drunk, so poisoned by alcohol, and he didn't know how to really detox anybody. So he prescribed two beers a day for me. I had a beer at lunchtime and I had a beer at dinner. And I was in the hospital for quite a few days. And he kept giving me a drink because otherwise I would have gone into some kind of convulsions or something. I don't know what would have happened, but he thought it was necessary for me to have a drink. The best way he knew how to, this was many years ago, there weren't detox centers all around. So he detoxed me in the hospital by giving me a couple of drinks a day. So I know how this is. I was very skinny, very malnutrition, had nothing. I was, I was really dying. So I know how bad this is. And I did the same thing Bill did. As soon as I got out of the hospital, I went and got drunk. So. We didn't learn very much in those days. So now in the next chat, uh, paragraph, it says, my brother-in-law is a physician 
and through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in national, a nationally known hospital for the mental and physical rehabilitation of alcoholics. Under their so-called belladonna treatment, my brain cleared. Hydrotherapy and mild exercise helped much. Best of all, I met a kind doctor who explained that though certainly selfish and foolish, I had been seriously ill bodily and mentally. And this is a big point in his life. This is where a big change started to happen. He started to realize that he was powerless over alcohol. And, and the doctor told him, you know, you have an allergy. Bill had never heard of this before. And the doctor, and we read it in the doctor's opinion. This is Dr. Silkworth at the Towns Hospital in New York. The doctor told him, you have an allergy to alcohol and a mental obsession to alcohol. And you need to, you know, you need to find some way to understand that you have a, that allergy. And if you drink one single drink, you're going to be just like you are now. You're going to be back in the hospital. So you have to just not have a drink ever. But the doctor didn't know how to go much further than that, but to tell him the truth, tell him that that allergy, once you have one drink, the allergy kicks in and you'll keep drinking. So don't drink. Bill didn't listen. And the so-called belladonna treatment. Belladonna was extract or something from a plant, the belladonna plant, and it's a powder. I discovered it one time years and years ago. I had belladonna and it was a a green powder, and you put it in a tin plate, lit it, and it just sizzled a little bit, and the smoke came out, and you breathed in the smoke, and it makes you feel like you're drunk. It gets you high, makes you feel like you're drunk, but it's worse than that. I mean, I hallucinated. I was really messed up on belladonna. I had no idea where I was, what I was doing, so belladonna turned out not to be a good treatment. Uh, and must have, might have helped them back then a little bit to get away from alcohol, have something that got them feeling like they were drunk, but not being drunk. But trust me, Belladonna was rough. And the hydrotherapy that they're talking about is also a treatment that was used then, but not used anymore because it's very similar to the torture method of waterboarding, which, you know, is outlawed, you know. But in the state hospitals and the sane asylums, they used to strap you on a gurney and run you into a shower room. And there were shower heads all around. And they turned one on hot. The next one was on cold. The next one was hot. The next one was cold. And they just streamed this water, hot and cold, on you for a half an hour. Bill said it helped calm them down. But it really didn't do anything to help an alcoholic get sober. What you got out of it, what the doctors got out of that treatment was a very clean alcoholic to, to work with. But other than that, it really didn't solve the problem of alcoholism. So those two therapies that they were using back then were not successful with alcoholics. And we know why, because it takes something different than that that we're going to learn about in a little while. Best of all, I met that kind doctor, and that was the trick. He met Dr. Silkworth. And then he started to learn a little bit. And he said, it relieved me somewhat to learn that in alcoholics, the will is amazingly weakened when it comes in to combating liquor, though it often remains strong in other respects. My incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop was explained. Understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope. For three or four months, the goose hung high. I went to town regularly and even made a little money. Surely, this is the answer, self-knowledge. So Bill thought when the doctor told him that, you know, he's got this allergy, and if he drink, that, drink alcohol, the allergy is going to kick in. If the allergy kicks in, you're going to get drunk. And he said, okay, so I know that now, so I won't let that allergy kick in. I won't have that first drink. But he couldn't stop. He didn't realize the obsession. And the desire for alcohol was bigger than his will, than his willpower. And that he didn't understand. So that self-knowledge he had was very incomplete. And alone, by that alone, he could not get sober. And he says that. But it was not 
for the frightful day came when I drank once more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. After a time, I returned to the hospital. This was his second visit. This was the finish, the curtain, it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure during delirium tremens. So the doctor told him he was going to die. You know, there was no help for him. Or he would develop a wet brain, perhaps within a year. She would have to have uh, give me over to the undertaker or the asylum. So the outcome from where he was in that second visit to the hospital was hopeless. The doctor said he's not going to make it. He's either going to die of a heart attack when he's, when he's withdrawing from alcohol. When he gets into the DTs, he's going to die of a heart attack. And if, it does, if that doesn't kill him, then he'll drink some more and he'll get a wet brain. And, and the wet brain, back then, they used to, if you got bad like that, you couldn't get help and you were a real mess, they put you in the state hospitals. And they would, you know, put you in until you got better. That was the sentence. You're committed to the asylum until you get better. Well, if you got a wet brain, you're not going to get better. And the state hospitals aren't really treating you. That was a bad outcome to, to be put in the state hospital because you were had a wet brain. And there was nothing else they could do. You know, the doctor told Lois that and Bill overheard him. And it was so it was a horrible thing for Bill to understand is that, you know, the doctor had given up on him. There was no hope for him. He was either going to die of a heart attack or have a wet brain. That's the two outcomes, which was better. So Bill says, they did not need to tell me. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride. I, who had thought so well of myself and my abilities, of my capacity to surmount obstacles, was cornered at last. Now I was to plunge into the dark, joining the endless procession of sots who had gone on before. I thought of my poor wife. There had been much happiness after all. What would I ha would not give to make amends? But there was, but that was over now. You know, he was beginning to understand that he was about to die. His life was coming to an end. He didn't know any way. He wanted to quit so bad, but he just couldn't. So he couldn't live with alcohol and he couldn't live without it. So that was his dilemma. And it was getting pretty bad. Now... In his mind, before AA even existed, this is where he really did the first step. And I, this is just an incredible explanation of what it's like to become powerless and recognize it and admit it to yourself. No words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched all around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. And in that moment, he was admitting that he was powerless over alcohol, that alcohol had the power over him. He was overwhelmed. He couldn't do anything about it. He was just overwhelmed. He was in loneliness and despair which is something that Bill suffered anyway. Without the alcohol, he suffered a little loneliness and, and, and despair and was somewhat depressed. The alcohol just made it worse. And so he got into this position and alcohol, he finally admitted, alcohol is my master. So the next paragraph. Trembling, I stepped from the hospital, a broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. Then came the insidious insanity of that first drink. And on Armistice Day, 1934, I was off again. So he's just out of the hospital. Armistice Day comes up. <clears throat> that was on November 11th in 1934. 
So remember that date, November 11. That's 11-11, 1934. Bill came out of the hospital. He said, everyone became resigned to the certainty that I would have to be shut up somewhere or would stumble along to a miserable end. How dark it is before the dawn. I read that and thought, what is he saying here? How dark it is before the dawn. He's been talking about the darkness that he was living in. The darkness of alcohol despair. You know, that that just wanted that drinking to oblivion. Having to drink 12 beers and two bottles of gin before breakfast. So he could eat some for breakfast. That he had stopped eating while drinking. That he's malnourished. He's in the hospital. I mean, how miserable do you have to get before you wake up? But he was... That insidious day came, and he still drank again. Every bond came became a certainty that I would be shut up somewhere or would stumble along to a miserable end. How dark it is before the dawn. In reality, that was the beginning of my last debauch. I was soon to be catapulted into what I like to call the fourth dimension of existence. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness, and a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. So a spark of hope there, and Bill was just pointing and letting us know he had finally met his match here. He had inside his head knowing that something had to happen. It talks about fear, sobered him up for a bit. Well, fear is a great motivator in our lives, in the lives of alcoholics. But then he also mentions that insidious insanity of the first drink. That turns out to be an inspirational thought that led to step two. That the insanity of drinking is maybe one second long. The second you say, yeah, I'll have that drink. You know, a drink won't hurt me. I could have a drink on a full stomach. It's okay if I have just one. That insane thought. And he recognized that as insanity of the first drink because he had done that over and over again. Every time he tried to get sober came the time when he went in to make a telephone call in a, in a place one day and, and, and then said, how did I get here? And he's pounding on the bar drunk. So little things he was doing, it didn't even give him a thought to, to make the choice to pick up a drink. Somebody shoved a drink towards him, he drank it. He went to... He went someplace and was talking with some guys and they, they offered him a drink. And he said, no, thank you. And he passed it. And a guy said to him, hey, Bill, you don't know what you're missing. This is New Jersey Applejack. And he said, well, I've never had New Jersey Applejack before. Let me give it a try. And he took it because it was something new, because somebody told him it was special. So he drank it. Well, he got drunk again. And that started another one of these month-long drunks. And this continued, this drunk here, continued for quite a while. It said, near the end of that bleak November, I sat drinking in my kitchen. With certain satisfaction, I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through the night and the next day. My wife was at work. I wondered whether I dare hide a full bottle of gin near the head of our bed. I would need it before daylight. So he's preparing to drink all day and all night. He's in the middle of this. And uh, something happens there. And we'll, I'm going to stop here for tonight. We're going to talk about that next week because this is uh, what happens next is he meets Ebby Thatcher. He's reunited with Ebby Thatcher, an old drinking buddy of his. And the story is remarkable. And we'll cover that in one fell swoop next week. So thanks for listening. I hope you got something out of this. I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you'll be here next week. Because next week is the beginning of the miracle. So please, come back. Thank you. Back to you, Debbie.